Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's program. Today's program is taken right out of the hypertrophy files. And the hypertrophy files are part of a series of lectures that I produce for you doctors uh, out of the basic science series for chiropractic continuing education. And today's program uh, is approved for six hours of continuing education in the general category uh, by the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. So uh, welcome to the program and thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoy today's program uh, quite a bit and that you get a lot out of it. The focus of today's program is going to be on two words and these are two words that I tell almost every one of my patients on almost every single visit that I have with them. And uh, these are some profound words and uh, you don't have to say really much more than these two words to your patients. And uh, if you're able to get a head nod from your patients uh, after you repeat this mantra uh, to them, you'll know that you're doing the very best thing that you can for them. And this applies to you as well. Uh, today's program is entitled Exercise Recommendations for Chiropractors and Their Patients. And so today's program is directed, first of all, doctors at you because uh, I know uh, what your life is like and I know what it's like to be a chiropractor because I am a chiropractor and I've been a chiropractor for 27 years and I know that being a chiropractor is, uh, is a physical job. It's, uh, it's a physically demanding, it's a heavy lifting job. So we have those physical demands on us also uh, as respected health care uh, authorities we also serve as role models to our patients so it's important that we practice what we preach and so I direct this program first and foremost to you doctor and then also uh, to your patients and the mantra and the two words that I constantly re reinforce both to myself and to my patients and, and that I want to impart to you and your patients is to up muscle up muscle it's the philosophy of this program and it's my uh, sincere opinion that we need to continually focus on increasing the muscle mass content of our body and this is regardless of age in fact uh, as we age through our uh, 30s 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. <laughs> I don't know where you lie on that spectrum, but uh, speaking for myself, uh, I'm probably at the midpoint of that spectrum and, and inching perhaps <laughs> slightly past the midpoint of that spectrum. And as we do age, it becomes even more important to focus on upping the muscle mass content of our bodies. So that's the whole purpose of our uh, program today is to learn how to preserve muscle mass and how to promote and grow new muscle mass regardless uh, of our age, regardless of our physical condition, or regardless of any limitations that we may think that we have uh, that prevent us from uh, doing just that, from building new muscle. So this is called the hypertrophy files. And this is one of several lessons in the hypertrophy files, which is a series of exercise, dietary, and lifestyle techniques uh, designed to promote muscle hypertrophy. So today we're going to talk about lesson number one from the hypertrophy files. And today we're going to focus on some exercise techniques involving and focusing on three very narrow principles. We're going to narrow this entire concept down to three simple, effective, and extremely powerful techniques that you and your patients can implement right away that will tremendously improve and enhance uh, the benefits that you get from standard exercise, whether those be performed in a health club or whether those be performed at home uh, with simple and inexpensive implements. And those three simple principles that we're going to focus on in this program include, number one, the biarticular muscles, the eccentric muscle actions, and the pre-stretch principle. 
and uh, of course we'll elaborate over the next six hours uh, on these three principles. So if you're ready with me, uh, I'd like you to grab your handout materials for your note-taking uh, benefit. Grab you a snack and a drink and uh, get ready to get down to some brass tacks of anatomy, physiology, and the science uh, behind muscle hypertrophy. Okay, let's talk about uh, lying tricep extensions. This is uh, another excellent exercise that uh, uh, fits into our compliance criteria for the big three. Uh, it involves a multi-articular movement. It allows uh, exercise through a complete range of motion all the way from passive to active insufficiency and also allows the application of accentuated eccentric exercise. <clears throat> so the reason that the tricep is a multi-articular muscle is because the triceps, true to its name, has three heads. Uh, there's a long head, a medial head, and a lateral head. And for the purpose of this discussion, we're going to focus on the long head, which is the one head of the three that is unique, that crosses or attaches on the far side or the other side or the distant side uh, of the shoulder joint. Now, the medial and lateral head of the tricep muscles both attach on the humerus. And so therefore, because they attach on the humerus and insert below the elbow, they are uniarticular muscles. But the long head of the tricep, <clears throat> because it attaches on the scapula and then uh, inserts uh, with the medial and lateral head below the elbow, it is a biarticular muscle. So let's focus on the long head for a moment. The origin of the long head of the triceps brachii is on the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. So that's the scapula bone uh, on the other side of the shoulder joint and has its insertion on the olecranon process of the ulna along with the medial and lateral heads by way of the thick tricep tendon. So the long head is <coughs> a multi-articular muscle. So as you look at this diagram here showing the long head of the tricep muscle, if you were to maximally activate the tricep muscles, what would be some positional factors that you would want to employ uh, to maximally activate the tricep muscle? Well. We're going to get into that, and I'm going to show you a video that demonstrates that. But you can imagine by looking at this uh, diagram of the tricep muscle that any position uh, that's going to maximally activate the tricep muscle must involve some lengthening of the tricep muscle over the shoulder joint in order to take advantage of the pre-stretch principle, in order to take advantage of the length tension relationship and in order to bring this muscle to a point of passive insufficiency to allow a great and strong contraction at the elbow joint, we're going to have to somehow stretch this muscle first across the shoulder joint. And I'll show you how we do that. Now, the triceps brachii has a couple of different uh, joint actions. Number one, because it's a multi-articular muscle, it therefore must have action at multiple joints. So at the elbow joint, we know that the action of the triceps brachii is to extend the elbow joint. And if you go in any gym across the country, you'll see uh, many exercisers doing elbow extensions and elbow pushdowns and all kinds of elbow kickback exercises working the triceps brachii only at the elbow joint, thereby missing out on the beneficial action of its other effect at the shoulder joint, which is to extend uh, the shoulder joint along with other accessory muscles such as the latissimus dorsi uh, and the posterior deltoids. 
So in order to take advantage of the pre-stretch principle, the pre-stretch position is with the shoulder flexed, thereby increasing the length of the long head uh, across the glenohumeral joint. So here is a video coming up to show you exactly how we would position our client or how you would position yourself uh, to take advantage of all the benefits that this particular exercise uh, has to offer. Now in the upcoming video that you're going to see, I want you to notice the pre-stretch position to passive insufficiency. This brings the triceps muscle, the long head that is, to approximately 120% uh, of its resting length. And that, that signals the beginning point of the range of motion of this exercise. So I'll roll this video here and narrate as we go. You'll notice that the seat back of this bench is in a nearly nice. vertical position. And it's the verticality of the bench that allows for maximum flexion at the shoulder joint. In fact, uh, when the subject gets his arms overhead, his glenohumeral joint is going to be in near 180 degrees of shoulder flexion. Any lesser incline, such as a flat bench or a decline bench, would reduce the shoulder flexion angle, thereby reducing the pre-stretch component and the pre-stretch benefit of this exercise. So let's roll this video and I'll narrate. Okay, notice there, approximately 180 degrees of shoulder flexion. Now bringing in elbow flexion and that is passive insufficiency and you can tell that the subject is at passive insufficiency at the bottom position because the torso starts to raise in order to create additional length of the tricep muscle. And then also, you'll notice that the training partner applied additional downward pressure to accentuate the eccentric portion of the range of motion. Now there are other additional intensity and hypertrophy training techniques going on here. You'll notice that that was a set of only four repetitions this employs another principle entitled the uh, rest pause uh, technique where the subject will take a brief rest, catch his breath, allow some of the creatine phosphate and glycolytic enzymes to regenerate before resuming uh, another uh, brief but heavy set of three to four to five additional repetitions. So those, those techniques are the subject of another program but uh, for this particular video, you saw uh, several principles in effect, and that was the multi-articular principle, the pre-stretch principle, and also the accentuated uh, eccentric principle. Um, the triceps can also be exercised in a variety of different exercises that uh, do comply with our big three requirements. One of the uh, most uh, convenient and easy to implement exercises is the cable tricep extensions with an overhead rope. And uh, this is also a multi-articular exercise that allows for a uh, complete range of motion from passive to active insufficiency. And in the video that you're going to see, you're not going to see the addition of accentuated eccentrics, although it's easy to imagine that accentuated eccentrics could be easily applied <laughs> easily applied uh, to this exercise. So here is the cable overhead tricep extension. You'll notice that the shoulder is, a fl is flexed uh, almost uh, to approximately, oh, approximately 150 degrees here. And throughout the range of motion, you'll see that he does extend back to uh, 180 degrees all the way to passive insufficiency. So let's roll the video.
Now, because of the incorporation of the passive insufficiency, which gives you the pre-stretch at the beginning of the muscle contraction, this creates a stronger muscle contraction than if the movement was simply taking place at the elbow. And this allows the subject to use much heavier weights than otherwise than if he was using just a uniarticular uh, motion at the elbow. And as we know, we need to train heavy in order to stimulate the type 2B muscle fibers, which contribute to hypertrophy. Okay, here's another subject uh, showing the same uh, exercise. And you'll notice the pin on the weight stack is moved all the way down to the bottom. In other words, this is the entirety of the weight stack. Now, this whole weight stack, no way could be lifted simply by incorporating the uniarticularity uh, of the triceps at the elbow. It's the pre-stretch principle and the uh, length tension relationship that creates the uh, infinitely stronger contraction that allows uh, 150 pounds to be lifted in this exercise. So let's roll this video. Good. Now notice that's approximately 180 degrees of shoulder flexion. Then as the elbow comes back into full extension, that takes the tricep muscle all the way back to passive insufficiency. And you can tell that you're at passive insufficiency because the torso starts to rock back to create additional length of the tricep muscle at the shoulder joint. In other words, to relieve the passive insufficiency. But it's that passive insufficiency that creates the pre-stretch and allows us to take advantage of the length tension relationship. Now that exercise was performed without the benefit of accentuated eccentrics, but you can imagine how uh, accentuated eccentrics could be incorporated uh, into uh, this exercise. Now for special populations, uh, meaning for those that may have an orthopedic condition, or for those whom uh, heavy weight lifting is contraindicated, we still want to incorporate the same principles. However, we make adaptations and modifications to the movement to accommodate uh, specific needs. So for example, for those with shoulder uh, injuries or conditions, we can decrease the incline. In other words, we can use a flat bench to minimize the pre-stretch uh, component. And this might be a useful adaptation that you would apply, uh, for example, with, to a patient that had fibromyalgia, for example. Someone for whom excessive stretch of the muscle uh, prior to a forceful contraction might be uh, dangerous or contraindicated. So that would be one adaptation. Another adaptation would be to uh, reduce the range of motion. Uh, for example, in the case of an elbow pain, there might be a, a portion of the range of motion uh, that uh, causes elbow pain, in which case uh, we would simply eliminate that portion of the range of motion uh, that causes pain. Uh, another adaptation would be to apply very light weight on the concentric portion of the range of motion, but add some accentuation uh, to the eccentric portion of the range of motion. So uh, the purpose of going through this uh, discussion on adaptations is to let you know that any exercise can be modified, uh, number one, to make it better and more beneficial for hypertrophy purposes, and also uh, can be modified and adapted to make it uh, uh, adaptable to those with uh, conditions or issues or otherwise for special populations. Really, we're only limited by our imagination as to the numbers and different types uh, of adaptations that we apply to each of these exercises. Okay, let's go in uh, to a couple of exercises for the biceps muscles and then uh, we'll move on to some exercises for the lower extremities. 
So here's a diagram of the biceps brachii muscle. And we went over this muscle a little bit earlier. <coughs> but recall that the biceps brachii is a multi-articular muscle. It spans two joints. It actually acts at three joints. But we'll, we'll concentrate our attention here uh, on the action of the biceps brachii at the shoulder and also at the elbow. So both of the heads of the biceps brachii cross the shoulder joint and attach on the scapula muscle. So the short head attaches to the tip of the coracoid process. The long head attaches to the supraglenoid tubercle, both of which are, <coughs> are on the scapula. And then by common tendon, they insert onto the tuberosity of the radius and also send a slip of connective tissue uh, known as the Lacertus fibrosis or the bicipital aponeurosis to attach onto the ulna bone. Now the action of the biceps brachii muscle is threefold. Number one, it supinates the forearm. Now, forearm supination takes place at an axis around the radius bone. And it causes the radius bone to cross over uh, and backwards and over the ulna bone. So this is an action that takes place at the radio ulnar joint. That's one joint. Then, when the forearm is supinated, the action of the bicep muscle by way of its attachment onto the radius bone causes a flexion of the forearm. And this flexion of the forearm takes place at the humerus, at the humeral radial and humeral ulnar joints. So there's the second joint action of the biceps brachii. Thirdly, the biceps brachii causes flexion of the glenohumeral joint. Now, it's not the only flexor of the glenohumeral joint. As you know, the, the anterior deltoid is a strong flexor of the glenohumeral joint. But the biceps brachii assists with flexion of the glenohumeral joint. And that's its third joint action. So in order to take advantage of the multi-articularity uh, and the length tension relationship with this muscle, we place it first in the pre stretch position, which is with the shoulder extended, thereby increasing the length of the long and short heads across the glenohumeral joint. So we begin in this position of passive insufficiency. Then, as a technique suggestion, as the elbow flexes, as the elbow flexes under, under the action of the biceps at the uh, elbow joint, the shoulder joint should flex as well, even if only subtly, because the biceps brachii is an assistance muscle for shoulder joint flexion. So we begin in the pre-stretch position in, in a position of passive insufficiency. And then as we go through the range of motion of elbow joint flexion and shoulder joint flexion, we approach the end position of active insufficiency. So this is a beautiful exercise that allows, uh, allows exercise through a complete range of motion, taking advantage of the pre-stretch and multi-articularity principles. Now, in addition, although the video I'm going to show you uh, coming up here in just a moment, uh, the video does not show the addition of accentuated eccentric. It does demonstrate the uh, application of some back pressure or some focus on the uh, eccentric portion of the range of motion. So this is an exercise that really allows us to take advantage uh, of all three of our big three principles. OK, so you're going to see a video now of an advanced exercise uh, known as the seated bicep curls with a stand up. And it's the stand up that may be a novel modification for you. But it's a critical modification because it's the stand up that 
provides us with the opportunity to add in considerable elbow, uh, I'm sorry, considerable shoulder joint flexion, thereby bringing this motion all the way around to its endpoint of active insufficiency. Okay, so let's roll this video. Uh, before we do, I want you to notice the angle of incline uh, of this bench here. It's set uh, slightly posterior to the vertical at approximately oh, a 20 degree angle. And the beginning position is going to allow a slight extension uh, at the glenohumeral joint, thereby stretching the biceps muscle across the glenohumeral joint. And I'll narrate here uh, as the video rolls. <coughs> So the subject is using dumbbells that allows independent motion of each of the arms and removes any constraint that would be applied by a barbell. So notice that the shoulder relative to the torso is in a position of approximately 20 degrees of extension. And then as the subject comes up, he completes simultaneous shoulder and, el uh, and elbow flexion. Now, without looking at the movement of the dumbbell, I want you to focus your attention on the range or arc of motion that the elbow goes through. The elbow goes through a distinct arc, and that is shoulder flexion, moving the humerus from approximately uh, 15 to 20 degrees of extension to approximately 45 degrees of shoulder flexion. This brings this maneuver all the way around to a position of passive insufficiency. Now with the application of some slight added pressure on the eccentric uh, portion of the range of motion makes this a perfect biceps exercise. And many of these principles can be applied to other bicep exercises as well. Probably the best of all of these is the one that I just demonstrated, the seated bicep curls with stand up. And it's the stand up that allows for the shoulder flexion. Some other biceps exercises that are conventionally done in gyms around the country, such as preacher curls, uh, do not allow the addition of the shoulder flexion component. However, uh, they do lend themselves uh, quite nicely uh, to the application of accentuated eccentrics. And so again, you're only limited uh, by your imagination. And uh, another good biceps uh, exercise we already demonstrated, uh, we labeled them pull-ups. The pull-ups with the weighted eccentrics can be slightly modified by uh, changing the grip to a supinated grip to more actively uh, incorporate the entirety uh, of the biceps muscle. Um, for special populations, these exercises can be modified. Uh, for example, the verticality of the bench can be modified to reduce the amount of uh, extension at the beginning phase of the exercise. Um, on a preacher bench ec uh, exercise, you can significantly lighten the weight on the concentric portion of the range of motion while simultaneously increasing uh, the weight on the eccentric portion of the range of motion. In fact, another useful modification is to simply eliminate uh, the uh, concentric portion of the range of motion and simply focus on the eccentric portion of the range of motion. And you would do this if you were assisting your client. You would do this by simply lifting the weight for them into the position of active insufficiency and then allowing them to resist the downward motion of the weight uh, as it approaches its position of passive insufficiency. In conclusion, uh, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I hope you enjoyed this program. Uh, now, 
you have a 20 question uh, examination that I need you to complete and either fax or email back to me. My fax number is on the top of the examination form and just as soon as I receive your examination form uh, I will provide you with a certificate of completion that you can use for your Board of Chiropractors uh, continuing education credit. For now, I want to leave you with uh, the website uh, for chiropractors, which is entitled ezchiropracticceu.com. We're always coming up with new programs, so check the website uh, frequently for new programs designed to help you uh, succeed as a chiropractor. Again, Dr. Perry Carpenter wishing you great success. If there's ever anything I can do to help you, feel free to call. Again, thanks for being with me on this program and best of success.